Hi, I'm Pastor John Ritchie of Grace Christian Fellowship Church in North Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, today we're going to answer some questions. A lot of folks have been writing in with questions, and uh, I thought we'd take some time to sit down and try to answer them best we can from the Bible for you. And the first question we're going to look at is probably the most imp important question a person could have in their lifetime, and probably the most important question that needs to be answered, and that is, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Well, the scripture is very clear. Uh, Paul the Apostle was asked in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, in verses 30 to 31, uh, when he was with Silas, after he was delivered from the jail, the Philippian warden and jailer came to him, bowed on, on his knees and said to Silas and Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the apostles gave them a very simple answer. I said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And that's how simple salvation is. It's simple belief, faith alone, in Christ alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, unfortunately, today, a lot of folks have been redefining faith. They're saying that faith means surrender and uh, obedience and commitment and perseverance and uh, sacrifice and of course this is adding to faith alone in Christ alone. The men who teach this, John MacArthur, John Piper, Paul Washer, some very big names, men who are popular on the internet and YouTube, and they're preaching another gospel because they're adding to faith alone in Christ alone. The scripture, 115 passages of the New Testament that discuss the subject of salvation. And these were all put together by Dr. Lewis Berry Schaefer in his Systematic Theology. There's only one condition that the New Testament stresses and lays forth as necessary and essential to salvation. And it's simply this. Faith alone in Christ alone. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes a synonym like trust is used. And what's faith? Faith is simply the acceptance that the Word of God is true. It's the inward conviction that what God has said is true. It's belief. It's not surrender. It's not obedience. It's not works. It's not penance. It's not feeling sorry for your sins. It's not persevering to the end. It's believing that the Lord Jesus Christ keeps His promises. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 Paul the Apostle said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and confessing the Lord Jesus doesn't mean making him Lord. You can't make him Lord like these Lordship Salvationist teachers try to uh, persuade us. He's already Lord. And when he spoke that to the Romans that he wrote that to in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10, he was speaking to a pagan group of people who were pagans before they were saved. Now they were Christians, but previously they were pagans. And when he said you confess Jesus as Lord, there were many pagan deities, numerous pagan deities. So to confess Christ as Lord, as deity, was something very radical at that time. Uh, today in the Christian church, now we accept that, the, you know, we realize there aren't many gods in the world. Even other religions like Islam realize there's only one God. But to confess Christ as Lord at that time was a radical thing because there were many gods that the pagans worshipped. And the Apostle Paul said, if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. Now, where's your heart? It's not here. This is a muscle that pumps blood. Your heart's here. As a man thinketh in his heart, the scripture says. And it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. Believe right what? Here. If you're convinced right here in your mind, your thoughts. If you believe that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Period. With the, what the Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, when you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose again, then you have declared righteous by God or justified, and at that point you have now the right to proclaim with full assurance based upon the character of God who cannot lie, I am saved. The, you're confessing unto salvation. You're saying, I am saved. Uh, believers should not be doubting their salvation. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how weak you may be, no matter how you may stumble, no matter how you may fail, and you will still fail after you be become a Christian, 
because once we get saved by God's grace, now we have to grow. And, and don't be mistaken, salvation is a gift of grace. The scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And grace means a free gift. It's not by any work you do. And it's free. The scripture says we are justified in Romans 3.24 freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's free. If something's free, you don't pay for it. And grace means this, God's unmerited favor. It means God gives us something we don't deserve. We didn't earn it. God didn't look at us and say, oh, they're so good, let me save them. He found nothing in us. God saves because of who he is, because of his character. He, is, he so loved the world that he was benevolent towards his creatures to provide for their greatest need. God did for us that which we could never do for ourselves, and he provided it at the cross, salvation. Now we receive it by simple faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. Anything else is another gospel. And we have to understand that today. Now let me give you a few verses in the New Testament that will help you understand this even better. In uh, Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul basically clears up the whole issue. If anybody will get rid of their religious preconceived notions and simply go by what saith the scripture. Forget the traditions of men. Forget what popular, t popular teachers are teaching today. Let's look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter 4, speaking of Abraham, the apostle writes in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified, and, and to be justified means to be declared righteous, by works he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham didn't do any work. Many times he failed the Lord. And yet, because he believed the promise that God gave, and God is all veracity and he cannot lie, he has to keep his promises, then Abraham was counted as righteous before God. He was justified. And then Paul says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Very important verse. If you work, then you earn something. You deserve a reward for your efforts. But that's a debt that's owed you. That's not grace. You see, grace means you did nothing, and yet you still received a reward. In verse 5, we read, But to him that worketh not, see, no works, no works at all, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse number 37, that any man comes unto him, he would in no wise cast him out. He said, he that believeth on him, John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40, he would raise up on the last day. John chapter 6, verse 47, the Lord Jesus Christ says, he that believeth on me. You now many of your modern versions leave out on me making it seem that just any belief in God will save. No, it's not a belief in a God, it's a belief in Jesus Christ. But John 6, 47 says, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Present possession. John 5, 24 tells us very, very clearly in uh, no unmistakable terms that those who believe have eternal life. I'll, I'll read that verse to you. And it it would do you well to ponder what's said here. Jesus says in John's Gospel, in chapter 5, and in verse number 24, verily, verily. Now, verily, verily means truly, truly. So when Jesus says uh, verily, verily, he's making an emphatic point. He's saying it for emphasis. I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And notice something. Eternal life is a present possession. It's not something you get in the future. The moment you believe, you're born again. We call it regeneration. The Holy Spirit comes and deposits within you the life of God, eternal life, the new nature. And at that point, you're born again. And he says, Hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And this salvation is a gift. It's not earned. It comes from God's grace, which was provided through Jesus Christ at the cross. And no failure, no sin, 
No mistake, no bad judgment on the believer's part after you're saved can ever cause you to lose it. Many of our Pentecostal brethren and holiness brethren teach that you can lose salvation by committing some sin. Even Lutherans believe this. No, you cannot. God may chastise you if you sin as a Christian, if you backslide, if you're going in the wrong direction, if you're getting out of his will. He'll chastise you because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. But he'll never kick you out of his family because Romans 11.29 tells us that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. When God gives a gift, he does not change his mind. And all through the Bible, uh, you know, people say, well, what about if I sin badly? Well, David uh, committed adultery and murdered a man. He didn't lose it. Uh, Peter denied that he even knew the Lord three times. He cussed and swore. He didn't lose it. Lot, shockingly, was involved in a, a drunken, incestuous relationship, and he didn't lose it. He disobeyed the God, and God was very carnal in many ways. He didn't lose it. Samson ended up running around with harlots and uh, drinking too much and disobeying God, and breaking his vows. Now, he didn't lose it. He's in the Faith Hall of Fame. Here's the thing. You can't lose it. Now, did these men suffer the consequences of this? And sure, they were chastised sometimes very severely and hostly. But they're in the kingdom today because salvation's a gift. And it's a shame that uh, many Christian people who claim to be Christian, and sometimes even big name preachers, cannot understand it. They've lost touch with the grace of God. So if you're watching today, and you have that question in your mind, what must I do to be saved? The answer is very simple. Listen, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And if you want assurance of that, take God at his word. He promised if you come to him, he'd never throw you out. It says in Romans chapter 8 that there's nothing that can separate the believer from the love of God. But God commended his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I know I deserve hell. But I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I'm not trusting in my good works or deeds, but in you only. Please save me and give me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.